I have to remember in the requirement of physics, and I work on the physics of the particle physics, and uh, so there is a model beyond that. Uh, I guess I am already done. Okay, right? Okay. So my area of interest is something that is called the standard model of and beyond. So now the question is that what I would like to emphasize today in this uh, one of our brief meeting. That what is particle physics? Why do you need a standard model? And why, as I said, that my research topic is standard model of physics? And so first we will motivate this thing, and then we will say that there exists certain limitations for the standard model of particle physics, and because of these limitations, you really need to move forward. And there exists a bunch of theories, and I mean, still we are looking for some experimental verification of those new models. So, what is the standard model of particle physics? So, for that, it's actually a lot of theory. So, I'm sure that some of you would like to pursue this particular director in future as a research career. So, it actually deals with too many basic things. So first of all, you need to know the quantum mechanics. Now, as you know, quantum mechanics was discovered or was needed to explain some of the shortcomings of the so-called classical theory. So one of these uh, was the black body radiation, then another thing was the optoelectric acid and the complex factor. Of course, semi classically you can provide some, uh, you know, some of the explanation, but it comes out like those are not adequate to explain it, or they, they really, you know, don't provide a complex way. So you need to move from classical to the quantum. So the natural question that okay, quantum mechanics is fine, but then why move forward? Now it comes out later. You will learn that in the quantum mechanics you can solve the problem of the hydrogen atom. And you know that hydrogen is a simple mass state. So you have one in the nuclear, you have only one proton. And only one electron. <coughs> so now I'm sure that you can solve it using the simple quantum mechanics and you can take the energy which gives life. There is a formula like I'm sure that most of you have had out of this. But this is the simple book. Now, you know, any progress in the field of physics or in the field of any basic science, there is an integral relation between the theory and the experiment. When people pass on the experiment, they actually observe some finer lines in the spectrum. Now, what is the source of these lines? You know, that gives some energy value for each of these energy levels. And these levels are something like this. So whenever there is a transition from this to this, so there will be an uh, energy difference and corresponding to this energy difference, there will be a emission of a photon, which you can directly experience. However, it turns out that they observe more lines than expected by this theory. Then people going to explain these things, there is something that is called the fine structure. So people try to explore that thing and they realize that the simple quantum mechanics is not enough. You need to move a little ahead. So then people try to work out a little bit more and then they realize that because the electron which is inside, it is moving at a very fast pace. Now because it is moving at a very fast pace, so that means if something is moving very fast, and at least say some things which is comparable with the speed of light, which you know is the absolute speed in the universe, then of course you cannot use the normal theory. 
you will feel something that is called a little bit of <coughs> And people are working out and they observe and it explains most of the things that is said. But then they realize there are few issues which can't be explained even by the linguistic system. One of this circuit, we will learn later. I'm just putting you the name. Lamp shift. It cannot be explained by that, even by the linguistic system. So, and also, there is one more problem about the quantum mechanics. It is taking clearly a one particle system. Now it turns out that if you really want to solve a many particle system, you need to move beyond the quantum mechanics. You need to, you know, uh, or explore a system of particles. So it turns out there the quantum mechanics is not adequate. So then you need something which is a mixture of the quantum mechanics plus something from the field theory together with relativity. So all together it leads in a theory that is called QFT, the theory, the quantum field theory. So this theory is competent enough to explain most of the observed phenomena as of today, but it does still exist some limitations, so there are motivations for going on. Now, the standard model of the particle physics, if you really want to explore it mathematically, then you need to really have a good understanding of this guy, quantum field theory. As well as you need to know a little bit about the group theory and a good amount of the relativity. So it is not something that you can you know, jump on immediately. But of course, these are far more advanced topics, and we are not here to discuss all these things. We would just like to give you a theoretic idea that how the standard model of the particle was formulated. So the first and foremost important thing about the standard model of the particle physics that what is so standard about it. First of all, what is a model in your understanding? So let me ask you all these questions. What is a model in your understanding? You know the Lincoln general model. You know the Lincoln's uh, model of the rabbit. That is something you all have in this. You know the, the law of M1, M2, G by R square. So, what is a model in your understanding? Let me ask you this question. What is a model? What is the meaning of a model? Yes, please. A visual representation of the scientific object. Yes, and so it is, I can clearly, you can say that it is a framework based on which you can explore or investigate the dynamics or the mechanics or the small behavior of a system or a system of objects. That is a kind of name and designation of a model. So, the first thing is that what is important about the center model? The thing is that as you know, you have so many particles in the region. The first question that they ask is that how to classify these particles into small groups? The first question that they ask is that for that the most important thing is that if you pick up a particle, whether this is the fundamental one or you have something more fundamental. Work, so, for example, as you all know, that the largest structure which is known to us is something of the order of the universe of the galaxy. So, if I give you the size of the galaxy, so I think I have a slide uh, there. So, just to give you a size of the universe. <laughs> but the generic case is that you can understand how large the galaxy is because you know uh, when you uh, consider about the galaxy, you typically use something that is called a parsec. A parsec is some light layer, and light layer means it is the distance that the light can travel in one minute. And you know the speed of the light is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meters per second. So you can understand with this speed if you consider the duration of a one year, how big it is. So it is an exorbitantly large distance. So this is actually a schematic layout of the size of different entities 
that will help with us. I'm sorry because this is an old slide and I think that it's something else. So you can see that if you think about the universe, you look at the size. 10 to the power 27 million. I am assuming only uh, I universe, not something like Mount Everest or something like that. And from there, if you go to our own solar system, you see it can go for 30 meters. And in this way, if you consider a typical human state, it is 10 to the power minus 4 meters. So you see the drastic reduction of the sun. However, if you consider a cell, this is elemental. If you consider the construction of any biological object, any animal, any any tree, say, something like that. But it is not the most fundamental structure. If you go inside the cell, you know there exist certain things like which you have studied in your biology. You have uh, DNA is even more fundamental, but you know there is something called a nuclear, then you have mitochondria, the ribosome, and different parts. And eventually, if you go even further, you go to the DNA. So in the DNA, I'm sure that some of you have studied this, uh, this helical structure, this uh, famous model for which one of the Indian got the Nobel Prize. So this helical structure, this adenine, guanine, cytosine, this, this chain. But even this is not fundamental because that is some element. So if you go further, you have the molecules and you see, look at the size, that is 10 to the power minus 9 meters. Even this is not the fundamental one. You go even bigger. You have the scale of that. Something that we just mentioned that the hydrogen atoms. But now the next question is that so this is the total and this is the electron. But well, this is the fundamental. It actually depends on the scale with which you are going. For example, if you are say 20 km above the ground, then it would be impossible for you to discriminate. If one red chain and one blue chain are lying next to each other. But when you are looking at this distance, you can estimate between them. So, this is related to your vision power, which is equivalent to in the context of the particle physics, this is something called at which energy scale we are talking about. So, there is a one on one relation between the energy scale and the length probe. That is why in particle physics, we normally use a interesting unit that is called a known as the AUF or natural unit. Now this is an interesting unit system. Why? Because in this unit, C is treated as 1. That means the speed of light is just a number. And the Planck constant, I'm sure that you are familiar with the Planck constant, this is also 1. But in here you know that these are dimensional points. So, if C is 1, that immediately gives you an idea that you are working in a particular unit system where length is equivalent to time. And if you do the same thing here, you will get a relation. Length and time are equivalent and they are equivalent to the inverse of the mass. So, that gives you an idea that whatever object you are probing, you need certain energy scale to probe that. So, for example, how many of you are, uh, how many of you have heard about this other for alpha spectral experiment? Quite enough. Now, you remember what was the experiment? <laughs> so, what is this other put in the alpha particles? And you know the energy of this alpha particles? What's it? MEV. Something was like 2.2 MEV, precisely what you know. But how is MEV? It is true that you can give me this counter argument that when Rutherford conducted this experiment, of course the detector or this uh, the, the technology was not that much advanced, it was not possible for him to use something more energetic. For example, something that we are using at the large background for that. Why not EV? Why not in electron go? What compulsion to use this MEV? Have you ever thought about that? Anyone, any idea? If you use this formula, it gives you a relation between the length scale and the energy. If you do that, it gives you an idea that MEV corresponds to a distance of 10 to the power minus 15 meters. Of course, you need to work it out, and I mean, you don't need to work it out right now. And then this is this talk is just to give you some take of mind. And that clearly gives you this idea that what was the motivation 
but rather for to use this particular code. Because if you use anything lighter than that, it is not possible to prove a length scale which is that small. So, if you really want to probe some things at the level of atoms, and if you want to probe some things at the level of the molecules, you need to use two different probes. You cannot use the same probe. In fact, at the large hadron collider, I'm sure that all of you have heard about this thing which is going on in the sun. There, the energy at which they are doing this experiment, it is 14 tera electron volt. And if you use the same formula, this is translated as 10 to the power minus 20 meters. Now the question is that why they are doing like this? But, so they went to atom, but the next question that they asked whether the atom is fundamental. Then they conducted some experiment and they realized that actually the atom was also very easy to see that was actually thanks to the other so that, that the atom is not solid at the whole. The entire mass is something to the nucleus and the electrons are moving around. But subsequently, with the advancement of the science, they conducted some more finer experiments. And they bombarded the nuclear with a ray of photon or a ray of electron. And they realized that the nuclear is not a fundamental object. Initially, it was thought that it is not a fundamental, it is composed of neutron and proton. But with energy enhancement, they tried to probe this nuclear with more and more energy objects, and they realized, I'm just giving you the name, something that we'll learn later. There was a famous experiment called DIA. Deep inner scatter. Through this experiment, they realized that the neutron and the proton, which earlier believed to be elemental, when Rutherford conducted this experiment, in Rutherford's idea, electron, proton, and neutrons were the fundamental objects. But later they realized no, electron is a fundamental object as of now, but proton and neutron, they are not fundamental. There is this certain substrate, which are known as the quarks. quarks. So, you can see that if you go deeper and deeper, that means you need to use larger and larger energy scale. So, the question is that why people have invested this amount of energy, and you know that the total loss of this large matter collect is abnormal, several billion years. Why they have invested? Because if after the full operation of the large hadron collider, which is going to be around 2030 or 2030, if they don't see any fundamental other factor, the only conclusion that we get is that up to a length scale of 10 to the power minus 20 meter, electron and the other appear to be the most fundamental structure. But you cannot rule out the possibility that if you go to a higher energy, higher energy collider, say 1000 TeV, and which you can go, say, in the end of minus 22 meter, there is always a possibility of getting some fundamental structure at this level. But if NHC fails to find anything new, that means up to this scale, electron and the quarks are the most fundamental ones. Now the next question is that, fine. So now we know that we have a fundamental set of properties. What are they? As I said, one of them is nothing but quarks. <laughs> so one of them are quarks. And we tend to know about another, which is here. Now it turns out, this quark, there are six types of them. So, which is known as the A, Ring, Char, Top, and Quark. And just like electron, there are three more graphs of the electron, which is neon and top. And there is a counter partner, which is the electron magnetic and the tau Now the next question is that, fine, so now we have a set of elementary particles. Why are we calling elementary? Because as I said, as of now, given the current state of R, with our existing energy flow, we cannot go beyond this. 
So as of now, these are the fundamental particles in our understanding. So now that we see the fine, now we have a set of particles. But fine, how is this to the center? So as I say, now the next thing that one needs to do is to see that okay, there is a group of quarks and there is a group of electrons, and why we are causing them to define things? And for example, there must be some property or a set of properties based on which you are calling them. For example, if I told to give you one square object and a round object, both are calling them. Fine. But if I ask you to discriminate them, then from their outer geometry, you will say that oh, this belongs to the square and this belongs to the square. Similarly, if I give you a red ball, a blue ball, and a green ball, and I ask you to differentiate this, then what will be the conclusion? As long as it is about the geometrical shape with the distribution criteria, all these three are the same. But if it is about the color, then this, 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 this three are different. So, this is, so in a similar way, in an analogous way, there exists a set of properties based on which it will have group this particle together. It turns out all these objects, they have fractional electric charge. So, Normally we know that electron is the fundamental unit of electric charge and that is minus one unit. However, for upward, that is plus two half. For down, minus one half. For train, again plus two half. For charm, sorry. For charm, plus two half. For strange, minus sorry. one half. And again for top, plus Just two half. Whereas right. for this guy, for the unit of electric charge is zero, and for all these guys, it is minus. So, from the viewpoint of charge, you can see that, okay, these two are definitely separated. But then, apart from charge, there actually exists more other properties. For that, as I said, you need to understand the group theory, but of course, we are not going to give you. I will just give you some examples. Suppose you consider six balls. Some of them may have the same color, some of them may have the different color. Now, some of the balls are blue, and some of them are having some spikes. So first of all, if I ask you to identify all of them based on their geometric shape, you can say that all of these objects belong to them. Then if I ask you, okay, now classify them based on their color, then you will say, okay, they may have different shape. This is something to learn a little bit about the forces and other things in your group structure. Now, depending on, suppose this is a red ball and this is a red ball. So if I consider color to be the fundamental property, then I can keep them together. But if I ask them that now let us consider to find the fundamental property, then these two are separate. So depending on the common properties, you can classify elementary particles into different groups. I can give you one more, I would say a better example. As you can see, consider a few English letters. A, B, I, P, H, O. So suppose, forget about them as later, consider that they are like six particles. Now, someone gives you the task to club them together. If you look at them, they are all different. However, let's do one thing. Let's try to consider the reflection based on a vertical axis. Could be that? So, if I consider that vertical reflection to be a symmetry, I can see Smaller and smaller. 
So this classification of this coax and relay curve was done on the basis of those. So just for the sake of information, mathematically this is called if you three of C cross if you two of A cross P1 of I cross. This is the mathematical thing, but this is way above compared to your current level. But this is so as I said. So as I said, here I just consider two operations: reflection across the vertical axis and reflection around the horizontal axis. But here, as I said, so these two operations are similar to some of the operations of this. So it turns out under this operation, only the quarks are tested. So I can plug up the quark with respect to this. However, the the electron, neon, tau, and all the neutrinos they are sensitive to this angle. They are uncolored objects. So based on that, I call all of them as left and so these are the fundamental entities of the center. So I have six four and six letters. Now it turns out, based on this group theory. They are further classified into different smaller. For example, as I said here, if you consider the vertical reflection, then I know I, A, O, and this A. Four of them can be grouped together. But if I consider another assumption that is along with the horizontal thing, then I know only this C can be grouped together, and this is a kind of system. So, based on that thing, it turns out. That these quarks they have something a structure like this, which is mathematically known as the Dublin structure. But these are something written like this, and similarly, this left quark are written like this. This is something called the family. And why it is called family? Because people normally call this up and down quark member of the first family. Strain and the charm member of the second family, and top and the bottom they are the member of the third family, and similar for the. Now, this elementary particles are there. Now the question is that, as we have understood through your uh, whatever you have covered till now, that you have heard about the gravitational interaction. You have also heard about the electromagnetic interaction. Have you heard about any other interaction? Yes. Strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force. Okay. So. Strong and the weak nuclear force. So it turns out these are the forces which are needed. How these elementary particles are interacting inside. Now the question is that why do you need to interact? Because as I said, that Rutherford probed these alpha particles using, uh, I mean, he in, I mean, investigated or probed the structure of the nucleus using this ray of the alpha particle. But why it was possible for him? Because there was a reaction between the target and the probe. If there is absolutely no reaction, then it is impossible for you to detect. For example, when you analyze the some say the rate that the RBC count or the WBC count, you remember you put some kind of pigment there, and then you actually observe this thing. But suppose you don't have any pigment, then of course it is impossible for you to discriminate anything. So you always need a proper probe. So essentially, if you really need to understand or to Explore or to discover this elementary particle, they must interact with something. So those interactions are needed. So as you mentioned, so there are actually four interactions. In fact, there is this plenty of interaction, but the thing is that if you want to boil it down, you will see there exist only four fundamental interactions in nature where you cannot express <coughs> one in terms of time. So for example, gravity is a fundamental interaction. You cannot Say that gravity is the form of weak nuclear interaction. No. But suppose you are writing on the board and you make some noise. It is a combination of what? Because given that the distance between my chalk and this is apparently it is friction. But friction is a kind of mechanical thing. But it is not one of these fundamental interactions. So you can actually combine this with two of the fundamental forces. That is always possible. So, I have two elementary, like 12 elementary particles, and as I have gravity, then 
So this is larger n. Here also you see electron. It is half n. But you go here, it is 100 high points. So even new is 200 times heavier than the Why such hierarchy exists? This is a open problem. We really do not know why this hierarchy exists. Why there exists a hierarchy of structure between the different families? There is an open problem. Of course, later you will learn a lot. There exists a lot of theory, and some are motivated by tree theory, some are motivated by some other. Uh, Group theory convection, but as of now we do not have a complete answer as to why there exists a hierarchy in the mind. Okay, so now we have fundamental particles, we have fundamental interaction. Now the question is that what the hell is four dimension? Now the question is that let us think about this situation in this way. Suppose you are working in a government office. So here it is your desk, here it is your friend here. and you have a stack of files in your desk and I hope it is not a conventional government office where the files do move. So, suppose you want to communicate some of the files to this table. How are you going to do that? There must be, if you go to any office, that is typically a peer office who is going to carry this there. So, this guy is going to carry a stack of file and put it here and again also put it there. So this guy is acting like the mediator of information between this two. So elementary particles are there, they are interacting with the fundamental forces, but we do need a mediator to carry this information from this end to that. And that goal is played by the force mediator. Which are nothing but the pion, which is the mediator of interaction of the strong force. Then you have W and the Z, which is the mediator of the weak interaction. And finally, you have the force of pion, which is the mediator of the electromagnetic interaction. And why is that important? Because normally we always say that two electrons, this is something we have already studied in this process, this is each other. But why it is written? They are written in the of photo so, these mediators are also an important part of the fundamental. So, standard model is not only about the group of elementary particles and three fundamental interactions. Gravity, as we know, it is not incorporated or embedded in the standard model, so you can take it aside. So, it is only about the strong interaction, weak interaction, and the interaction. But because this guy marks up to this guy by something, and that only is. In fact, that is something which is interesting. If you have studied in some public literature, often people call this guy because they carry a strange quantum number which is called a color. Now, the question is that why it is called color? The color is related to fact that this was this was based on some theory, I am not going to detail. But it turns out that this guy can talk to a pair of four. Both this and this, and both of them can carry different colors. So that is why, by default, the blue of the mediator of the strong interaction, they must be a bicolor of Because it can connect to this guy and this guy, and this is not necessarily a condition that these and these are going to carry the same color. They can carry different colors. Okay, everything is fine. Now the next question is that, as I said, that there is a difference of this nomenclature. That's strong weak because it is electromagnetic and gravity can understand based on their name. But why you are calling them strong and weak? Because it is this name are derived based on their mutual interaction state. So typically we consider the strong interaction to be the strongest one and call it one. So from that viewpoint, the electromagnetic interaction is typically one and one by one at each other. And I'm sure that most of you have studied the high structure concept. And if you remember the value of alpha, which is x squared by 4 pi, is nothing but 1 by 1 by 2. So that is the typical string of the electromagnetic interaction. On the same scale, weak interaction is known as the integral minus 6, and the gravity is known as 0. So, just the sheer looking at this number can also give you an idea that why gravity is not an integrated part of the center. Because you see, look at the interaction scale. 
Now the question is that how do you produce them to be reactive when your theory says that they can be reactive? So that role is played by this T5. And that was one of the reasons why in 2012, the person who predicted this thing, this was predicted in 1964 and finally in 2012 it was discovered in the large hadron collision. So if you look at this slide, you can see that if you prefer to do research in this area, you can understand that how much time and dedication you need to put in. You see, the electron was discovered in 1897. And finally, the Higgs was discovered in 2012. So you see, it's a long way. And each of these, as you can see, how many Nobel people have, you know, acquired just because of this thing. Because each of them was a scale of a ten. So if you are doing anything new, you can understand that it took us 1897 to 2012. At least to complete the theory of the standard model. So you can understand that if you are looking for it is beyond the standard model, you can understand probably you need to wait for another 100 or 150 years. With experimental design. Some of this is possible as of now because, see, for Higgs, people even search for Higgs even in the general electron of the quad, like semi lab or this thing, people also search for Higgs. But those experiments were not. So much advanced for that actually we can go with. And finally, at the ADC, it was possible for people to probe this thing. So you can see it's a huge legacy. And some of them are very famous scientists and because they do have contribution in other areas of the business. And this is a kinetic, you know, diagram of how these elementary particles are interact. So the leptons, as I said, they carry only electric charge. So the leptons can interact via photon, so they can interact with photon, they can interact with the Higgs boson, they can also interact with the W and the Z boson. But as you can see, there is no line which is connecting this and this to blue. So that means they have nothing to do with the strong interaction. They took care of it. However, if you look at the quark, they are everywhere. They do interact with Higgs, they do interact with W and Z because they have some weak charges. As I said, they do not carry an integral charge, but they do carry a fractional charge. So they are also sensitive to photon, and finally they are sensitive to the dual because it is a strong interaction. So this is a schematic diagram, and something is really interesting why there is a blob like this. That means these are the particles which actually can self interact. So this means self interact. That means, so for example, here you can see. There is no block like this. One electron cannot self interact with another electron. But two or more than two Higgs bosons can interact with each other. And same thing is true for the W and for Q. In fact, this particular self interaction is extremely important. You know why? Because if you go back a few slides back, you realize I mentioned that. This is infinite range, this is infinite range. And we normally associate infinite range of any interaction with the pair that the corresponding mediator is natural. If you work out, of course, it's a help of a job, you will see that the blows are also massive. So, how come for R, here a massless photo is giving the infinite range, and here a massless photo is giving the infinite or minus 15 range? Why? Both are massless. Something must be wrong. Any idea? Both are massless. Here is infinite, and here the range is only 10 to the power minus 15 meter. It is trapped inside a nucleus. What? Any idea? Yes, please. What am I coming into your mind? See, that is the motivation of uh, doing this thing. Whatever coming into your mind. See, that is how we all learn. Whatever, coming. yes, please. Because the most is as it does. That is the only one. A photon cannot interact because now you go to this picture. Yes. 
you look at it. There is no block along the photon. So a photon cannot self interact. It is impossible to see any point where two photons can interact. So if something is completely uninterrupted, it will go all the way up to infinity. Suppose tomorrow one of you are going through the road, say in the era. Do you believe that people are going to come for a few minutes to say hi? But tomorrow even in Virat Kohli is going there. Everyone will just try to say hi, hello, for an autograph, for a selfie or anything. So this is the difference between having self-interaction or not. On the contrary, a blue one is massive. But what will happen? Just after a little bit of work and it will interact with one more thing. Then another blue one. Then this will interact with this. And this will eventually seize the data. So instead of being an infinite rate, it will restrict only within the density of minus. 15. So this is one of the remarkable feature of having additional charges. Photon is one particle which is electrically neutral and it has no other charge. If you want to, suppose you want to interact with that, you will have three and three of photon. You will have any child and you will have any brain. Is it at all possible to talk to him? No, because you have no common point. But if you have any two common points between two of the two of you and your friend, then of course you can do so. That is the situation between the photon and the blue. But blue, they have self interaction. So they can talk to each other and that actually reduces their energy. And that is why it's all interesting to find it. But photon is completely neutral. It doesn't care about another photon. It can go all the way up to it. And giving you the electromagnetic interaction is of infinity. Okay. So, now so far so good. Now the question is that, as I said, so this is the schematic diagram. That time definitely this Avenger was very popular. So I picked it up for as I said, that the particle physics, the kingdom of the particle physics, which is the standard model of the particle physics, this entire framework relies on certain symmetry principles. Of course, mathematically, this is equivalent to it. We don't want to go into mathematics. And as I say, all these laws actually formulate the matter. But when you do experiment, you detect magic also. So it turns out that either my theory is wrong or my experiment is wrong. Now it turns out that whenever people discover something in experiment, they are not going to verify it immediately, they are going to play it and experiment it. They will keep on doing again and again and again. That is something called getting statistical significance. After a certain point of time, when you are going to get the same result from four or five experiments, then you have to accept it. So it turns out that theory is fine because otherwise you cannot get a theoretical model to put everything in. But your experiment is giving you something. So there must be some way. And that is why the symmetry principle comes in. As I said, that depending on the symmetry principle, you can see. So, what people did, thanks to this idea of this Higgs and other, so they did this idea of the Higgs particle and they did something which is very really interesting. They say that there is a symmetry breaking because without symmetry breaking, we cannot get as much of it. However, that the symmetry is broken or is gone only at the ground state. What is the meaning of that? So, you consider a thing. Which is like this, you put it there. It is symmetry. It is going to stay there. However, if I just give it a thing, now if this symmetry is there, it is not going to fall in the same direction. So that means that as long as it is standing from the viewpoint of this plane, any circle is a possible ground. Ground state means the lowest energy configuration. You can just go with it. However, as long as I am holding it like this, it is not guaranteed whether it will follow this direction, this direction, this direction. So when it is standing, then from its viewpoint, there is an infinite many possibilities. All directions are equal. However, once I let it go, it will pick up only one ground state. So that means, out of infinite many possibilities, you have to pick one. This is almost equivalent to go for a copy. There are 20 red balls. As long as you are not touching them, all 20 are equivalent. Now instead of that, I want to have one. So one is picked up. This is exactly what is happening. So, 
the symmetry is broken with respect to the ground state, but not with respect to this. So it is the symmetry of the ground state which is broken, but the symmetry of the original theory remains at the That is the gist of the spontaneous symmetry breaking followed by the HC So of course it is not a good idea to go further details. I mean essentially what happens. In real life, this is a situation like this. So there is a so you can call think about some Mexican hat, and the symmetry principle is exactly like that. As long as the particle is here, which is something similar to this, it is an absolutely symmetry. But now let it slide. There is no guarantee that it will slide there or there. It can slide at any of the positions. But the moment it slides down at one of the positions, the symmetry is gone. So the ground state. Symmetry is gone, but it remains here. And that is the main idea of the spontaneous symmetry breaking and the so called Higgs mechanism. So, of course, there is no point of going to the degrees of freedom. However, the thing is that, that as you know, that finally they got their Nobel Prize because now we have discovered the Higgs boson in 2012 as a collector. So, these are the two gentlemen who got this thing. But to be very honest, that you see, any discovery, it is not a job of one or two people. In fact, more than that, there are more people who actually contributed actively in this area. But it turns out, these are the three people, Raoul Pasteur, so it was the Engard and Higgs who got this Nobel Prize. But it is actually a contribution of more than 16 people who actually helped to discover the Higgs boson as it is. But not all of them were duly remembered. And this is the schematic diagram that how we are doing this thing and the collider. And one important message from this slide is that we always have this idea, and some of you would going to do theory or some of you would prefer to do experiment, we always have this idea that you need to always have some positive result. No. In physics or in any science, when I'm getting together with the physics. So before LHC, there was another collider which is called the lake, large electron position collider. And you think about their idea that for well planned thing, when they make this left tunnel, they already had in mind that in the future they are going to be this. Way. So they already made it 27 kilometers. And that is exactly the same of the LHC. So there they did the operation from 1989 to 2000. Of course, it was the energy was really low. Around 200 GB, so it was not possible for them to detect the Higgs particle. However, the negative result very fast is one thing, it gave a lower bound that it cannot go below that. And finally, we have discovered that as the LHC. And in between that, there was also another collider called Megatron, which is a proton anti protein collider. And this collider is particularly important because this gives you an idea. It is not only physics which is going to be helpful, it also be helpful from easy. So engineer is not just you know, doing some simulation doing something. The girl who because it was already well known that how to make a proton, <coughs> but it was not well known how to make a prepare anti-proton beam. So along with the girl who discovered the physics part, the person, vendor who designed this thing, the engineer, he also got a Nobel Prize. Because it was an equally important part. So both things are parallel. It is not like I am doing basic science, I don't care about the engineering, I hate an I don't care about the basic science. If you really want to do it properly, you should have a well idea about the thing. So the I just wanted to tell you one of the success of the standard model. So there is certain quantity which is predicted by the standard model and it will also measure the quantity in very sophisticated experiment. So you can see that how successful standard model of the theory is. The difference between the standard model prediction and the theory is 10 to the power minus 10. It's an exorbitantly small number. That gives you this idea that there may exist some physics beyond the standard model. But that contribution is really, really not that easy to predict in the actual. If you look at the number, it is 10 to the power minus 10. However, the most unfortunate thing about the standard model is that. One thing is that, as I said, that you are working in the kingdom of the quantum field theory that allows some correction. And if you can incorporate those corrections, 
the mass of the heat should be very 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 high. Unfortunately, experimentally what we should observe, it is around 120 degrees. So the big question is that why there is such a difference? There is absolutely no one. One option is that they are input some other theories which somehow and the hints that we have discovered is just one of the hints and there may be few more which is waiting in the pipeline. So this is a situation something like this, you know, theoretically it is expected to be too big, but in reality it is too small. So that is one of the burning problems of the standard model. People normally classify this as a standard model as a fine-tuning problem. Of course, mathematically it is very difficult to understand, but you can actually try to understand it very simply. Well. Suppose you went to a shop and you purchase something of two rupees. And you say that okay, I'm going to transfer 500 million euro into your bank account and you can do that. Is it a natural thing? No. That is actually the problem of the bank. That you are having something which is too big. And you are subtracting another number which is also too big. And the number turns out to be only 100. Which is a big problem. Why it is whether the theory is perverted or that is a limitation of our understanding or maybe the mother nature is right there, we don't know. But that is one of the problems of the center. But that is more on the theoretical part. The bigger problem is that on the neutrino. You all know that the neutrino oscillation has been discovered and in 2015, this is the they got the Nobel Prize So of course, Nobel Prize means that it is there. You don't have to take it. If it is there, now the question is that in the standard model, as I said, the neutrino are massive. But now, your experiment is saying that neutrino are massive. How to accommodate that? In the pure standard model, absolutely no. You need to extend your standard model. There are plethora of models. For example, some people believe that there are right handed neutrinos, some exotic particles, but what is the final answer? It is still open for them. So you can work on these things and maybe you are going to, maybe next 50 years, you are going to see your picture next to this model. And the final aspect is that it's dark matter. Why is it also a problem? Because when people observe certain things, uh, there was certain predicted behavior as people, I mean, I'm sure that all of you have studied the Kepler's laws of motion. So, in the Kepler's laws of motion, you know that so there exists a relation like this. Somehow, I mean, when something is moving in orbit. So you can manage the centripetal thing with the resonating acceleration. If you do that, it gives you that the velocity actually varies like something like this. So one would expect that if I look at the center of the galaxy and I move all the way up to very large distance, that this is what is expected. But you will observe something completely different. It is more or less constant. That is only possible if you have more matter than expected. However, that matter, whatever it is, it is not visible. Because if it was visible, you can immediately detect that using the luminosity profile of the star. That is something that you can do. So, what is that matter? We don't know. That is what we call in a dark matter. Now, whether the dark matter is a particle or something else, as of now, no matter. Some people believe it's a particle, some people believe there exists not particle, not a lot of Many things. And along with the dark matter, there is also another big thing that is called the dark matter. What is dark energy? I mean, many of you have seen people normally give you a pie chart thing and they actually show that only 4% is actually the visible matter. Then you have some uh, amount of dark matter, there is a big chunk which is called the dark energy. What is the origin of dark energy? As of now, we do not have a complete chemical answer. So, these are open questions. But all of these things, neutrino, dark matter, these are the so called limitations of the standard model. So they give you this idea that in spite of its stupendous success in explaining the elementary particle interaction, we do need to go beyond the standard model to encounter some of these factors. What is that? So I would like to end with this that this is more or less the scenario as that is now. We are actually here. That is the standard model, it is going to and there is just a plethora of reason model beyond the standard model. Some may be called dark matter model. There is something called the supersymmetric theory, which is something that helps you to 
data dark matter the nature of masses. There are some models where people have multiple leaks. There are some models people watch out the experimental model people believe that apart from the four special dimension, we have additional dimension, and maybe the particles going there and coming there, and that's all we're taking. See, these are all exotic possibilities. But which one is the right model? Apart from we don't know. Because for all of this particular model, unless you discover some experimental thing like that. You cannot claim that this is the right one. These are all theoretical speculation as of now. Of course, after the discovery of the Higgs particle and the continuous evaluation of our collider experiment, already most of this beyond the standard model will be serving. But it is not the complete. So, I will say that is my end of this thing. That you really don't know. But we are waiting for us tomorrow. So all of you are pretty young. So if you are interested, please read. And not only I agree, but you have a clinical and interview rooms. We do have very few institutions here. And for example, we have an institution like TF and IIC or the particular activist people who are working in another type of collector collaboration. So you can also be a part of this thing. And for your information, India is actively working in the US. There are four collectors named for experiments. Two of them are CMS and SMS. And we have a very, very big group of scientists working in CMS. There is a group, big collaboration one of the India scene. Maybe some of you can join this team and do some one. So thank you. And so let's take a question. Yes. The question. Yes, please. That is something that is a rare property. That is always there. But what I am saying is that that is not fixed as well. If you repeat this experiment say for 10,000 times, what is the problem that is the problem of the That is not That is that is just one thing, but we cannot say that the Suppose you put it at the same time. What will you expect? It is to lie on the same line on the same time. It is not possible. So if it happens, what you mentioned, maybe that is what has happened in the early universe. By nature it is there. So in fact, what you mentioned, in some of the stream models, they have this idea something called the lens. So they say there are infinite number of lenses. And some accidental mechanism or a has to be exactly on one of these where everything is changed. Why? That is the thing. What you mentioned that's a very important thing because if you are interested, you can go and look at a plot. There is a nice plot, which is again an experimental plot. And this plot is very surprising. There is a plot where people consider the mass of heat versus the mass of torque. And there are three different regions in this plot. One is called the region of instability, one is called the region of stability, and one is called the region of metastasis. What is the physical region? If you have a potential like this, this is it. If you have a potential like this, there is a deeper meaning. Then if you have a ball like this, this is metastasis. But if you have something like this, this is not so It turns out that with 125 is small, it actually put up in the boundary of this metastasis. So maybe tomorrow at some extent it will be something like this kind of space. Gone. Whatever. But while we are there, apparently there is no complete theoretical understanding. But it turns out that's why this 125 GB map is something very rare. But it turns out we are actually in the boundary. A little bit up, we put it in trouble, and a little bit down, we put it in a safe place. But why we are actually on the boundary, I don't know, no theory at That is always a possibility, but then what you mentioned that is a very healthy point. But for that, what you need to do, as you know, classically, this cannot come. But quantum mechanics is something called the tunneling. So tunneling can happen. Then you have to calculate the lifetime of that. It turns out that that lifetime as of now is greater than the age of the universe. If it is not smaller than the age of the universe, then of course everything is gone. Then there is no point, there is no IIT and no lecture. That is the thing. 
But any case, so in fact, what you mentioned, many people, as I say, dark matter, there is also a class of molecules which are decaying dark matter. But if it is decaying, that means everything could have been finished by now. But when they are into the cell division, they are that it is decaying, but the lifetime is greater than the age of the age. Then you have said, maybe in another two million years, it will happen. So, you know, theorists are very cunning. They always do a little bit of manipulation to save the thing. See, any theory you can be saved in two ways. Either you consider the interaction parameter is very weak, or you consider the particle which is moving in the super heavy. Then, of course, you must say, if it is say, super heavy, then you cannot detect it at any object collider. That is why something called the complementary flow is very important. For example, now you know, after this history of the gravitational wave, this is a really interesting that kind of study. That can give us some indirect evidence of what has happened long back in our which you cannot replicate with an object before. So those are also equally important. Sometimes it is possible, it is not possible to do an experiment directly. Then you do, but suppose you know that if there are five parameters involved in experiment A, which are the same five parameters, it's also involved in experiment B. Experiment B is clear in an object. You do the experiment, you get the results. And if that is true, then from there you just try to get further which kind of conclusion you can have. That is called the method of continuity. To know about another experiment from the result of one experiment which is doing. That is something that we have done. It is one of the very hot topics in this. Yes, please. So we are so we are told that gravity gravity depends upon the masses of the two particles. Yes. So and you said that the masses are given. If you believe in Newtonian gravity, if you write down your gravity is like G M1 M2 by R square, of course it depends on the mass. But for example, if you go to the Einstein version of the gravity, it's not the It is it has nothing to do with it, is a, a geometry of the space. See, this I can give you a simple example. Suppose uh, you consider the motion of a river like this. If you are standing there, you can see this middle. But suppose you are on top of this middle. And for you, you will see nothing. You feel like you are going there. So, the idea of the Newton and the idea of the Einstein, they are different. Because from the, if you follow the Einstein approach, then this interaction is happening because of the structure of the space. The simple example you can think about that is you ask one of your friends to hold a big sheet and you put a massive ball inside and there are some tiny balls there. If this ball is very massive, that will definitely distort this straight thing. And then the remaining ball will actually follow that ball. This is a very layman's example, I must say. Yes. Uh, so, can we solve the demonstration not in the geometry uh, if the possibility is But uh, in the absolute state, if we consider the particle to be expected in the absolute state, so it, so it is not a particle. What I am saying is the ground straight law can see When you are holding this like that, so there is an infinite many ground state. All the directions are equal. So I, I'm sure that you have I mean, you have uh, worked out about the magnetic sample. So in the magnetic sample, you know there are tiny magnets, A, 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 like there. And even then, if you consider a non magnetized state, they are arbitrarily oriented. Now, which is going to be your preferred direction? It is not natural. Suppose you put a bar magnet in this direction, it will move in the direction. You put it here, it will change the direction. So it is exactly like that. So when it is like that, I think you don't know whether you can solve which direction or the zero. So that is not working. But how it is going to solve? That is completely unknown. But if it has picked up a particular direction, then the selection is working. So the overall theory remains symmetric. However, the ground state of the theory is no longer symmetric. So that was the motivation because the thing is that, as I said, there are too many things in their space. So, I mean, it is related to something called the existence of a Goldstone boson, then there is this, uh, uh, then before you have the spontaneous symmetry breaking and then followed by the heat mechanism. It's a huge thing. But it is the symmetry of the ground state which is broken. It is not the symmetry of the overall thing. That is why both of these two aspects are like theory, which predicts that my mediator is supposed to be massless, an experiment where you have detected massless. So, 
essentially it is the ground state things which you have to do. But overall thing is the same thing. But things are not. That's it. Question? If you would like to discuss more, feel free. Any more questions? No? I'm sure you have learned something new and you have enjoyed the session and uh, we can gauge that by the questions that they are asking. This yes, seems to be pretty interested and he has sparked you know, that interest and curiosity in you. So if that alive, you can write to him. Check him on our website, IIT website, you know yeah. his name, and you can write him. Write me if you have any questions. Yeah. Questions yeah. or further you want to collaborate, work with him, any guidance you can write to him, and I am sure he will also be interested to answer. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I would like to thank Professor Pradipta uh, for this wonderful talk and very interesting slides and interesting explanation on the board. Um, and I extend my sincere apology for the initial glitch, but I am sure you enjoyed the interactions as well. Right? Did you enjoy? Yeah. Yeah. Did you learn anything new today? Yeah. Okay, so thank you for coming to IIT Delhi. We are very happy to see you all here every Saturday, every month. You know, we conduct these sessions. So we'll also interact with you in future probably. Okay, we'll see you in the future and thank you for coming to IIT Delhi. I also would like to thank the schools and the teachers who were accompanying the students. So, big round of applause for the teachers. This session would not have been possible without the cooperation of our staff members, Mr. Gaurav, Mr. Ajay Dev, and Yanda, Ms. Renu, and Shorya, our volunteers. Yes,